fire aboard ship is probably one of the hardest types of fires to fight and control. And if the ship also happens to be in a dry dock at the time, then it can be just as helpless as a turtle flipped over on its back. This is what happened to the Sally Albatross over a three-day period, while she was lying dry docked at the Finnboda shipyard on the outskirts of Stockholm. Over to the Finnboda shipyard for an eyewitness account from a reporter. When the fire started, you couldn't see the flames, just clouds of thick smoke pouring from the bow and stern of the Sally Albatross, docked for repairs and maintenance work. The fires thought to have started on one of the car decks. Some welding work was being done on board and this probably started the fire. The Sally Albatross, a cruise ship about 150 meters long and 24 meters wide, towers nearly 30 meters above the bottom of the dry dock. Originally built as a car and passenger ferry in 1980, she was later converted into a cruise ship. The upper car deck, Deck 4, was then fitted out as a conference and exhibition area and renamed the Expo Deck. The lower deck, Deck 2, was mainly used to store ship supplies. On Tuesday, the 9th of January, 1990, the ship was in the dock undergoing minor repairs and modification. This included moving some scuppers and drainage wells on the Expo Deck, Deck 4. A team of welders and platers were busy cutting away the old scuppers and welding them at their new locations. Holes were being cut straight through the deck down to deck two below. The shipyard's firewatch was on duty down on deck two while this work was going on. On the deck below, beneath where the work was being done, were stockpiles of ship's stores. These had previously been covered over to protect them from damage from the work above. The fifth scupper had nearly been cut through when a welding spark clogged the nozzle of one of the cutting torches. The metal worker stopped working to clear the stoppage. Thinking that the work had ended, the fire watch then left his post to go ashore. The plater, however, resumed cutting. Sparks from the cutting torch fell on the stores below, setting them alight. The fire was spotted by the ship's first officer, who just happened to be passing at the time. He sounded the alarm throughout the ship. Knowing that the ship depended on its water supply from ashore, and that because of the cold weather and freezing risk, the main water hose from shore to ship had previously been drained, he rushed down into the dock, heading for the water mains. Other crew members made their way down to deck two to help tackle the fire. After running out of fire hose, they were shocked to discover that there was no water. Some of them clambered down into the dock, following the path of the empty fire hose, only to find it had been wrongly connected. They reconnected it and continued tracing its path in the dock towards the ship. Close to the ship, they discovered that two sections of the fire hose were missing and that water was spurting out into the bottom of the dock. They managed to find some extra lengths of hose so that the water could reach the ship. In the meantime, the fire was spreading and intensifying. Those of the crew fighting the fire on board were now finding it increasingly difficult to remain on board. They began to retreat. Some men are ordered up to deck eight to get kitted out with respirators. Fire and smoke is intensive and now starting to spread along a ramp between decks two and four and via open stairwells. The order is given to abandon ship. One of the crew has already contacted the International SOS Center for assistance. After counting the crew evacuated from the ship, the captain discovers that two crew members are missing. The senior fire officer ashore is told of this when he and his men arrive at the scene. The firefighters ashore soon realize that the only access route into the ship is over and through the open hatch at the stern. Supplies of water are driven up in fire tenders on the quay. The fire chief is then told that the access route into the ship and to the center of the fire is about 125 meters long through thick smoke. 
He quickly decides to form a rescue team equipped with respirators who will use the access route to try and reach and rescue the two crew members trapped aboard. More reinforcements have now arrived, including fire control command personnel and land-based firefighting units. A rescue team taking their own water supply with them go into action over the stern of the ship. One of the trapped crew members, a woman, was saved when she managed to catch the eye of a crane driver by waving at him through a porthole. The crane driver hoisted her to safety by dangling a platform beneath the crane jib. The other crew member trapped aboard, an engineer, was spotted by firemen ashore, standing on deck four, surrounded by thick smoke. He was rescued by running out a ladder from one side of the dock, which he had to crawl six metres along to safety. Below him was a drop of 13 metres straight down to the hard metal bottom of the dock. Firemen wearing respirators, forcing a path inside the ship, met a wall of fire after only advancing 20 or 30 metres. About 11.30 a.m. an explosion occurs ahead of the firemen battling on board in the smoke. The team fighting the fire by the open hatch feel the shockwave from the blast. The firefighters start to retreat. The senior fire officer coordinating operations now decides to recall all of his men and break off further attempts to get inside the ship. The access route inside the ship is now more than 100 metres and the risk of further combustion and fires spreading to the upper decks is extremely high. The two missing crew members have been successfully rescued and an explosion has occurred. The fire chief is told there are probably more bottles of gas aboard, which could mean more explosions. The firefighting resources and command centre ashore have gradually been reinforced with other essential units. The firefighters have been joined by two communications coordinators, members of the police force and ambulance personnel, as well as engineers and other experts from the shipyard and the ship itself. A number of alternative solutions are discussed, but soon rejected one after the other. The hatch at the bow can't be lowered. Spraying foam from the bow down to deck two won't work either, because a hatch inside will block its path. Feeding the sprinklers on deck two with water from a fire truck won't work either. Most of the fire hydrants on this deck are open, so the pressure drop will be far too high. And protecting the engine room by activating the ship's CO2 sprinkler system won't work because the bottles were sent away for pressure testing. What about tackling the fire from the water side with firefighting boats? There aren't any close by, and this could cause instability problems. It's finally decided to try and stop the fire spreading externally in the hope that internal sections and bulkheads will hold and confine it inside the ship. The fire down in the engine room, if there is a fire that is, seems to be fairly manageable. So it's decided to create a line of limitation around the engine room. A truck carrying supplies of carbon dioxide is brought up and CO2 connected to the engine room via a hastily welded connection in the hull of the ship. Throughout the day, ship inspectors from the National Swedish Maritime Administration and insurance representatives arrive at the scene. About 40 firefighters from the fire department are kept busy trying to contain the fire. Attempts to extinguish it are made from both sides of the dock, as well as attempts to cover the decks above the fire with a smothering layer of foam. An attempt to use a bomb robot lent by the police and equipped with a water cannon failed, because the robot's path inside the ship was blocked by debris and ship stores. Late in the evening, firemen with respirators managed to gain entry to deck two and extinguish the fire there, thus enabling them to now work their way up and down through the ship. Cabin sections found ablaze below deck two also threatened the engine room. Fires on a deck above where more cabins are situated as well as the restaurants threaten to break through shafts that lead straight down to the engine room. If this is allowed to happen, then the fire will spread throughout the ship extremely rapidly. It's vital, therefore, that these fires be confined and extinguished. The firefighters are having a tough time in almost unbearably hot and dangerous conditions. 
Three men have already been sent to hospital to be treated for burns. Frequent explosions can still be heard from inside the ship. These are being caused by bottles of carbon dioxide and other gas bottles overheating and exploding and being flung around the interior of the ship. Firefighting on this scale needs a great deal of backup and resources. Consequently, a support depot set up on the quay is kept busy replacing used air bottles, looking after the pumps for the water being consumed to fight the fire, refueling and on-site catering for the large numbers of personnel now involved at the scene of the fire. On Wednesday, it's time to concentrate rescue operations on the engine room itself. Sensitive components are lubricated to protect them and dehumidifiers placed out, while fire extinguishing operations continue outside and around the engine room. While the fire was being fought, shipyard personnel kept a careful watch over movements of the dock, waiting for a potential stability problem. This subsequently occurred the day after. Several tons of water had formed into three giant pools on deck four. As soon as these were discovered, drainage holes were blasted at the bottom of each pool so that the water could drop down to deck two below and drain off into the dock via the scuppers. This solved the stability problem. The latter part of Thursday and most of Friday was spent mopping up. Now and again, however, new fires broke out, but these were easy to confine locally. On Friday morning, the 12th of January, the senior fire officer gave the order to wind up firefighting operations after nearly three whole days of non-stop firefighting. Firemen from the fire department with respirators had entered the ship on more than 400 occasions to fight the blaze. Two lives had been saved and the ship's engine room was intact and virtually undamaged. The rest of the Sally Albatross, a cruise ship capable of taking about 2,000 passengers, was a burnt out wreck. How could a tiny welding spark on deck two cause so much damage? Let's recap back to the first few hours of the fire. The time is 11 a.m. and when the first fire tenders arrive, the situation looks like this. Then everything happens at once, fast. Why the fire spread so quickly was mainly due to the two car decks remaining in open and direct contact with each other. Also, several of the fire safety doors leading to stairwells inside the ship were wide open when the fire broke out. The outcome could have been entirely different if the ship's sprinkler system had been connected to a water supply. Why then was there no water in the sprinkler system nor in the fire hose that the crew rolled out? Earlier that day, the fire watch had reconnected the water supply from the hydrant ashore to the ship because some surfaces beneath the ship needed cleaning before painting. The water supply had quite simply been borrowed without giving a second thought to the consequences. A tiny welding spark plus a series of circumstances cost within the region of half a billion Swedish crowns. <laughs>